Welcome to the final part of the lecture on uh, biosensing and imprinting technology. In this part of the lecture, I want to introduce you to some of the key concepts that we develop at the Sensor Engineering Department at the Faculty of Science and Engineering of UM. Now, one of our core research lines at the Sensor Engineering Department is circled around a method that we call the heat transfer method. It's a readout method for biosensing where we insert a thermal current underneath a sample of choice. Mm -hmm and we measure the temperature that comes out on the other side. And what happens is if you have an interfacial layer with some kind of a receptor layer, this can be a bioreceptor, but also a molecularly imprinted polymer or a surface imprinted polymer, what you'll see is that when something binds to the layer, the heat that is inserted underneath the sample transfers through the sample into the liquid and gets blocked whenever something binds on the receptor layer and we'll see a block in the heat transfer through the layer and that we can measure with two simple thermometers one underneath the sample and one above the sample in the liquid flow cell where we pump our uh, samples through now a colleague of mine originally developed this sensor for the detection of dna polymorphisms in in, in dna strands now what does that mean this means that there is uh, a mutation that is related to some disease uh, inside the DNA of a patient, whereas healthy people don't have that mutation. Now, what happens is when you have single-stranded DNA, because DNA always consists of a double helix, you have single-stranded DNA and you incubate this single-stranded DNA on your chip with uh, single-stranded DNA from a patient or a healthy individual, they will hybridize and form double-stranded DNA again. Now, what happens when you heat up uh, the sample at a certain point, the DNA strengths will denature and they will uh, leave the surface. Now, what we see happening is that when DNA goes from the double stranded state to the single stranded state, it will collapse onto the surface, cover the surface, and will increase the temperature uh, resistance, the thermal resistance at the salt to liquid interface. So it will cover the sample and temperature has less, will less easily diffuse from underneath the sample through the liquid above the sample. So what you'll see is that the thermal resistance at denaturation will increase uh, when the strands go apart. Now, what you see is in, in the curve on the right bottom side is that when DNA is healthy, is fully matching, you'll see that at a certain temperature of about 64, 65 degrees, the DNA will denature. You will see that if you have a mutation, as you see in the orange and the green curve, is that the DNA is less stable. So the duplex is less stable because there's a mutation in there. So there's one mismatch. Uh, so it's easier to denature the two strands from each other, meaning it takes place at a lower temperature of about 55. And by analyzing these melting temperature or these melting curves with our heat transfer method, we are able to detect mutations in DNA, which is, of course, again, commercially very interesting in terms of DNA analysis and, and detecting certain diseases. Now, we can also use the heat transfer method in combination with uh, synthetic receptors such as MIPs or NIPs. And you can see that whenever MIPs bind their target, you see that the thermodynamic properties of this polymer layer on the interface start changing. Also, the heat transfer through these molecularly imprinted polymers gets blocked and it's less easy for temperature to diffuse from the chip into the liquid. And that's what we pick up. The same happens uh, with bigger molecules that can also bind to surface imprinted polymers that we discussed prior in the lecture. We did this in our lab for bacteria, and we used E. coli and uh, Staphylococcus aureus as model organisms because they are the most easy or the most uh, abundant uh, examples of gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. And what we did was we imprinted surface imprinted polymer layers with E. coli, and we expose them to both E. coli and Staphylococcus aureus. And what you see happening is that in the beginning, only the target, so E. coli for the E. coli SIP and Staphylococcus aureus for the Staphylococcus aureus SIP, will lead to a temperature increase that you can't reverse by simply flushing. You'll see in both cases that both the target and the analog will lead to an increase of thermal resistance because they lay on side the layer. But when you flush the layer with water, you'll see that the signal drops back to baseline for the non-target uh, bacterial strain, meaning that you can flush it off while the actual target binds into these cavities on the surface and leads to an increase in thermal resistance that you can't reverse by flushing.
For the business case in our lab and for the labs, we'll use a different approach. We'll go to substrate displacement colorimetry. A colleague of mine, uh, Joseph Loden, uh, developed this technology during his PhD. And the, or, uh, the, the principle is actually very simple. What you do is you take an MIP for any target. In this case, he used amphetamine. You get the target out and the target can rebind. You can detect that using HDM. You can detect that using electrochemical techniques. But what you can also do is before you let the empty MIP rebind to the amphetamine, you can load it with a dye that's somewhat similar to amphetamine in structure. So it will bind into the MIP, but the affinity that it has for the MIP is high enough to not just wash it out with water. So it's a colored MIP that doesn't release any dye when exposed to water or any other type of molecule. But when it, it's exposed to um, um, a solution containing amphetamine, amphetamine will have a higher affinity for the MIP than the dye. It will bind to the MIP, push the dye out. And what we see then when we filter the liquid off is that the dye gets colored when amphetamine is present. Now, as you see the right bottom side, the graph, you'll also see that that doesn't happen when you use regular water or when you use water containing another chemical. At the lab, we use this in a European project and we developed a similar sensor for the detection of vitamins. And we want to do that because there were several companies, including BASF, that wanted to know, like, what if we have tomato, right? And we grow that in specific conditions. European Union now states that we can only make claims about the food content, vitamin content in these products based on a certain table that gives you the general amount of vitamins it has per 100 grams of substance. We want a sensor that can actually detect whether or not there's more vitamins or less vitamins depending in the tomato, depending on the way we culture it. So we build a sensor based on SEC for the detection of vitamins in liquid food products. Now, what you will be doing in Bank 1008 is something similar. So the business case in Bank 1008 is, can we use SEC not only for the detection of vitamins or for the detection of amphetamine, but can we also use it for the detection of antibiotics, which is important, right? If we can detect antibiotics in liquid food samples, for instance, we can know, okay, this milk should not be sold to people because there's antibiotics in there, which are bad for your health, but also might end up in the environment leading to the creation of superbugs, right? The more antibiotics there are in the environment, the more bacteria get used to these antibiotics and the more easy they survive exposure to these antibiotics, creating bacteria that can infect you and cannot be like combated anymore with antibiotics. So it's very important to have good sense for this to make sure that food producers don't put antibiotics in food so that it cannot spread to the environment. Now in the lab, you'll definitely not, will not be working with antibiotics speci specifically for this reason. Because if we use antibiotics in the lab, you might spill some, it might get in the like sewer system and contributes to the problem that we actually want to solve. We will work with a model system using caffeine, which is an, a very, uh, a very harmless chemical substance that kind of reacts in the same way to most uh, to most antibiotics in terms of imprinting it into MIPS. We'll make MIPS for caffeine, we'll extract those MIPS, and the second part of the lab, we'll fill those MIPS up with a dye and see what happens if we expose it again to caffeine. Will the dye get displaced? Will we see concentration reading? Will our sensor work? Then in the lab report, you will report on the theory. So how does SDC work? What are MIPS? And then you will explain what you did in the lab. You'll show us the results and you'll show us what they mean. But in the end, again, because you're business engineers, you also have to couple that to the business case analysis. Was the SEC that we did in the lab successful? Is it useful? Why is it useful when we want to go to antibiotics? Is it portable? Is it cheap? Is it fast? Or maybe your conclusion is SEC might not be perfect for antibiotics. And you read an article somewhere on a better sensor for antibiotics, and you explained why that sensor is better than SEC. That is the business case that we want you to present, and that's what we want you to end with in the presentation on your lab report. Thank you for your attention. We'll discuss this more in depth during the tutorial on business case two.